This is the Blood Red Podcast from the Liverpool Echo. It's the Blood Red Podcast, courtesy of the Liverpool Echo. I'm Guy Clark. Welcome along. Happy Jurgen Klopp Day to all and all a happy sixth anniversary of having the German at the Anfield helm. Today we'll be talking through those glorious six years and throw ahead to how plans are already shaping up to continue his Reds legacy beyond 2024. Plus, there's transfer news to get into, as well as talking about the big takeover in the Premier League as the fog on the Tyne begins to clear. To get into all of that, we have our senior digital football journalist, the O Squires, and resident Red, Dan K. Gents, I trust you are both well. And uh, Theo, throw over to you first. And as I said, right there at the top, Today, six years ago, Jurgen Klopp was being confirmed as the Liverpool manager. And, and what a time it's been since. It's been an incredible time, hasn't it? And that's flown. Six years. Wow. What, where's the time gone? Uh, you think back to when he, he first took over, turning up in his smart suit, and there was all the excitement there. And when the negotiations were happening, and it was rumoured, you're thinking, no, no chance. Liverpool can't get Jurgen Klopp. He is just too good a manager for where they were at the time. Like they just had Brendan Rodgers at a time when they were. it was going to be Re- Rodgers or Martinez. And you're just thinking, no, how can they pull this one off? And then they go and somehow do it, and he just wins the fans over straight away with doubters to believers and all this sort of stuff. You look at the team he inherited, it, it wasn't the best. Not a patch on what he's got now, what he's managed to turn some of these players into. It's just incredible. And it has been one hell of a ride. And you hope it's going to just keep on going. Um, I think whenever he signs, what was it, a new contract a couple of years ago, you're thinking, oh, that's great. We've got another couple of years of clock. You don't need to worry about it now. But now it's itchy feet again, thinking, oh, that's going to expire soon. Can we tie him down for a bit longer? But yeah, he's built best Liverpool team I've seen in my lifetime. Um, Dan's obviously got a few of the glory years up there, so he can have a bit more competition for it. But I'm sure he's going to say the same. Klopp side is one of the very best. And when the time does come for him to leave Liverpool, he's going to be up there in what? Their top two, top three greatest ever managers. He has built a sensational team. And if it wasn't for the pandemic, I'm sure we'd be talking in this podcast how he's won more than a one Premier League and one Champions League. Their, their circumstances have uh, clipped their wings a little bit, but now they seem to be back to their best. And you're hoping that it can be a legacy that you can look back on and be proud of when the time does call, go um, come for him to call time in his Liverpool career. Yeah, definitely. One of the things I want to focus on today, talking about him, Dan, is the man, Jurgen Klopp, as opposed to the, the games and the moments. We, I remember we did a podcast last year when it was the fifth anniversary. We kind of looked through those big landmark moments to getting Liverpool where they were. But just the man himself as well and the way in which he's reconnected the fan base with the team and the way in which he kind of has those Shankly hallmarks. As Theo says as well, actually, when you do strip it back and look directly at the success in in years to come, maybe people go, oh, it's one Premier League title or it's one Champions League. Of course, there can be plenty more to be won. But you look at, at Shankly and actually the trophy hall may be not quite as big as the impact actually he had on the football club. You were there the first day for the press conference. And I suppose even from then, it, it kind of shows that kind of understated but box office element that we get with Jurgen Klopp. Everyone was clamouring for the line. Who are you? Are you the special one? Which one are you? And he goes, Haha, no, I'm the normal one. And yet then mm. comes out with doubters to believers, just rolls off the tongue. He's not trying to be corny or come up with a line like Jose Mourinho all that time ago, calling himself the special one. And that is it, isn't it? He's un- understated, but he is box office. And as I say, you were there for that that very first press conference. I, I think that's a very fair analogy, Guy, in, in terms of uh, Jurgen Klopp and Bill Shankly. Bob Paisley you know, is the most successful manager in Liverpool's history in terms of trophies. No one would ever wish to diminish his achievements, but he would be the first to say that he really was following in Shankly's footsteps. And, and I think you know, the, the real parallel is there between the the utter belief and mentality that both managers, and obviously we're talking specifically about Klopp here, has managed to infuse not just into his into his players and his coaching staff, but into the entire Liverpool fan base. You know, in all my time watching Liverpool, and I've got, you know, probably you know, 15, 15, 20 odd years on on Theo there, <coughs> I've never known any 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 manager, any player, not just in Liverpool, but any other club to completely change a mood surrounding a club and with uh, you know in such quick time and with and with Klopp really it happened really on this day as soon as the appointment was made you know you, you have to remember that there was a real dark cloud swirling around Liverpool for 
the 18 months, well, 15, 16, 17 months, or however long it was, between not winning the league in April 2014 and Klopp taking over in the October. You know, for, certainly for people of my age, you know, it, that was that felt like it was the best chance of our lifetimes. And when it didn't happen in 2014, I don't think I was alone in thinking, well, when's this kind of when's this going to come about again? Obviously, you factor in the Gerrard trauma in, in, in all of it as well, and there was a real funk hanging over the club that that you know that, that just didn't look like it was going to be shifting anytime soon. And obviously, Rogers was um, let go in the aftermath of the one-one draw at Goodison on the Sunday afternoon. And you know, within probably a few hours, certainly by the Monday or Tuesday, Klopp's name was being linked with the, linked with the role. I didn't really see it happening. Obviously, I, we knew who he was by that stage. I think he, I think I'm right in saying that he began his last season as Dortmund manager with a pre-season friendly at Anfield, didn't he? Um, at the at the you know in August 2014, I didn't you know I, I just kind of thought, well, he's what, arguably the most in-demand manager in European football. Why is he going to come to us when? We're a bit of a black, we're a bit of a farce at the moment, you know. The, 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 the on and off the pitch, and what, once it became clear that he was going to come, and, when, and then when it was confirmed, the the enormous shot in the arm that it gave everybody um, was it, it was it was like the biggest insulin shot if you're a diabetic that anyone could possibly have imagined, and it just ha- it just got everybody massively going, and. You know, you mentioned his line about doubters to believers. I mean, obviously, he's got tremendous charisma, yeah, humanity, empathy. These are all a lot of the aspects that make him, you know, not just a great, you know, a, a very, a very able football tactician, but a great manager, a great man manager, and that's why all his players would walk through brick walls for him. But he's also extremely perceptive, and so well, he, he knows how to play the media game. He knows how to come up with a good line. He may well, he may well have had the, the normal one up his sleeve. You know, in in advance of his opening press conference, and obviously the club didn't hang about in in marketing that and getting that on baseball caps and mugs and everything in. <coughs> excuse me, in very quick time. But the line about doubters to believers, I, I think, showed a real understanding about where Liverpool were as a club, not just for the eighteen months since Gerard Slip and not winning the league, but by that stage, what twenty five years, a quarter of a century, without winning a league title, and it was. It was a, it was a new it, it it was it it was hanging over the club's head and, and clearly has weighed heavily on a lot of very very talented football managers and football players and all that time. Klopp obviously all, all you know he, he seemed to be very much aware that there was a disconnect between you know the fan the fan the, the supporters and the team. You know Shankly's fabled holy holy trinity holy, tr- holy trinity of manager supporters and uh, players. And you know, as we as we will get on to, literally within weeks, he was already basically calling that out, making reference to it, and putting his cards on the table and basically saying, "We're not going to get anywhere unless we're all rowing in the same direction." That was his first big job. And you know, when people talk about greatest moments here and there, and there's still plenty of people even now who mock, but that day when he took the, when he took the team to the cop after that 96 minute Divock Origi equaliser against West Brom, that to me was one of the most important moments of his whole reign because it showed a, a massive awareness about what needed to be done and and it brought people together and you know i think you can draw a lot there was after the barcelona semi-final there was a great mock there was a great picture where people put the two together and in, in my in my mind the second one doesn't happen without the first one it, yeah. it, it, it was a hugely it was a massive moment and i don't think you can underestimate its importance no definitely and theo he is a generational talent as a head coach, manager, whatever you want to call him, I suppose, from Dalgleish, Souness, sort of the Roy Evans, Julia time, Julia by himself, Benitez, Brendan Rogers, how it all goes on, actually the way in which he was able to overcome all of kind of the adversity, certainly for that hunt for a league title that Liverpool had had and actually really restore Liverpool, not just to winning a title in a one-off season and that be that, but this now spell of of really being the challengers and a dominant force within European, uh, within English and, and European football that Liverpool hadn't been for a while. But I, I come back again to kind of how understated he is about it, or whether it be Buvac moving on, whether it be Pep Linders coming on and taking more and more sort of of the coaching setup type thing. He's always very quick to kind of delegate to people with great experience and knowledge. Michael Edwards in kind of doing the transfers, and and that's a sign of a, a great manager, but also equally 
you can't underplay kind of the role he does have. I thought it was fascinating after the Man City game when he was speaking in his press conference and with Sky Sports after the game, how he tactically went in depth, which we rarely see from Jurgen Klopp. He's always very quick to kind of downplay his role within things. And as I say, be this guy who delegates and uses expertise around him. But he is far greater a genius within the the corridors of power at Liverpool than maybe he himself even realises, no? Yeah, it's, when you look at it, he comes in, he's this big beaming character and he gives the players a hug and you think, oh, he's a great man manager. Maybe he's yeah. just given him that boost. But then you scratch beneath the surface and this is a managerial genius. Um, like you can compare it to some of the other big managers we've had in the past, what, 20 years. And Mourinho and Benitez are going to be the obvious ones to mention. They're not as good now as they were 15 years ago because... They struggled, I suppose, to adapt to the change in face of the game. Like Mourinho, it's still that defensive football. And it, the way he manages is still the same as when he was at Chelsea. Now, it's just not as effective now. Whereas Klopp, one of his biggest strengths is how he's evolved, how he's adapted. If he's not got the right answer or the strength and something, he'll go and speak to one of his coaches. He'll make sure his team is as strong as possible. And it, I think it was um, Ragnar Klavan that he did this podcast in Estonia a couple of weeks ago when he was talking about how, how Klopp, uh, Klopp's coaching setup is involved in stuff and like the fitness side of things. And he was saying Klopp is so involved in the game, he can't take that step back and say that player's a bit knackered, we need to take them off or make that change. So to have that trust in your coaches to say this player can't start this game or they're not fit enough to go past the hour mark, that shows the faith. But you never have him doubting any of his coaches He's always got so much faith and it is a team effort. And that's why he's so understated about it all. Because Liverpool go and achieve this success, but you take any one member of it out and it could easily fall apart. But you've got to have faith that they could find a replacement to it. But it is very much a team effort. And you think how Liverpool, it was all gang pressing when he first came in, very much that rock and roll football he promised. That wasn't going to win him a Premier League. That wasn't going to win him a Champions League. He had to adapt it. Uh, he knew he needed this big centre-back like Virgil van Dijk. He had to wait for him to become available. So from then, he went a bit more defensive, didn't he? Rather than having both full-backs bombing forward, he'd have one of them bombing forward with the one, um, Joe Gomez being a bit deeper as back three for that stability. Then he signed Virgil van Dijk and it was fine. You had that security there. He had the playmaker in Philip Coutinho that could unlock any team. That was the way of playing. Oh, he's gone. Actually, we don't need to replace him because we've got two fullbacks. We can go back to this attacking style. The fact that you can just change it like that and still find a way of making it work it is extraordinary. There are similarities there, I suppose, to Ferguson. Like you think of any histories about him. They're saying he was very switched on, hands-on in United's early glory days in the 90s. But as he got older, he realised football was growing and he maybe wasn't as attuned to it as he could have been because he was an older generation manager. But he got his coach and staff right. He got them spot on. He had the right people around him as he took more of a step back. But he was still the focal word, getting the best out of his players. And while Klopp isn't taking a step back anytime soon, it is definitely set up as well as it can be to make it work and to be a well-oiled machine. If it wasn't, it wouldn't have been such an easy transition when they lost Buvac. The fact that everyone was worried when that happened, and then you're thinking... Why were we worried? Pep Lindis has come in and he's done a great job to the extent that if Klopp goes, there are some that will think Lindis could do a good job as his replacement here. It just it has that throwback to the days of Shankly and Paisley where you think it's a Liverpool family that you could take the manager out and they could still find a way of pushing forward. But it is all a t- you combined unit to make it all work. And that's the reason they've managed to go from what was essentially on the verge of being mid-table fodder to champions of everything. Yeah, definitely. It it feels as well, doesn't it, Danny? He speaks the language of the fans. He's never trying to be overcomplicated and fancy within press conferences. And maybe that was a, a fault maybe of Brendan Rodgers at times during his time. He, he maybe got carried away with it all. But Jurgen Klopp does kind of just seem to speak to the supporters and be a football man who kind of just knows what he needs to, to get done. And I suppose a big part of it, Theo alluded to it there as well, is, is how he's adapted and changed Liverpool during the six years and even his own philosophy and outlook on the game. And I wonder how key Pep Guardiola has been to that. We're always in the media keen to build it up as a big rivalry and adversaries. Theo mentioned Sir Alex Ferguson and kind of the rivalry he had with Arsene Wenger that saw the two of them get the best out of themselves. It feels as though with Klopp and Guardiola, we are kind of at that stage where Klopp now has 
changed his approach more, more controlled, more measured. That midfield maybe not as frantic and hectic as it once was. It, it was certainly more functional. And it felt coming into this season, certainly with Harvey Elliott during the first few games before he picked up his injury, and now even maybe with Curtis Jones, that those two wider central midfield players, as it were, are maybe beginning to become a bit more like the likes of sort of Kevin De Bruyne and Bernardo Silva of not just being functional players, but guys who get right around the midfield and really open up teams as as much as anything and provide goals and assists from midfield, which for a long while now has, has been a bit of a criticism. Yeah, there's there's definitely been an evolution, hasn't there, in in how the team has played and how Klopp has had to kind of react to the circumstances uh, around them. You know, an awful lot has happened in five six years, and I think there's absolutely no question that him his Liverpool team has brought the best out of the Manchester Pep Guardiola's Manchester City team over the last couple of years, and vice versa. It has become the preeminent rivalry. Of the modern age, that's not wishing to discount Chelsea, obviously, who are obviously champions of Europe. But um, you know, Guardiola knew knew Klopp was coming, I think. And you know, it, it, do you remember the the the, the documentary that came out uh, behind the scenes at Manchester City? I think just as they were winning that league in 2018, I think the, the game at Goodison when they were only a game away from clinching it, which was just before the Champions League quarter final against Liverpool, and. Guardiola's respect and to a certain degree some sense of trepidation about the damage the Liverpool front three could do to his team was very much there. By the same token, I don't think that Liverpool team that won the league was would would have got 99 points or have need or or have needed to get 99 points if they hadn't been conditioned into this very real knowledge that you that you needed to basically aim for 100 points to, to win the league. I mean I think it, but it needs repeating as well. I actually, I read this somewhere the other day and actually checked it out, looking at LFC, you know, the wonderful LFC history website, which is, which is a, a fantastic resource for anybody in our game, but also you know anybody that loves Liverpool and and statistics. And basically, between um, b- b- before the defeat at Watford, which was the you know um, towards the end of the year that they won the league. Um, the 38 ma- the 38 Premier League matches before that, Liverpool won 36 and drew two, which I don't think anyone has ever come even close to doing that. I don't think it will ever be done again. Now, obviously, you can manipulate statistics to prove certain things, and we've had you know if the, you know Liverpool would be top if the league started at Christmas or whatever. But this isn't just kind of like a little period of ten you know ten games, twenty games, a year's worth of football essentially, and they only drop four points. That's remarkable. And, and, were and I were think, they at Everton think, and Old Trafford? Is, was that right? Yes, that, 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 that's right. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I, after the, the and I, ironically, Watford bookended the two. For the the five nil midweek win against Watford when Van Dyke got two near the end, they just dropped points at Old Trafford. They yeah. then went to Goodison on the Sunday and drew nil nil. Won every game to the to the end of the, of the season. Obviously, finished second with ninety seven points, and then. For the first twenty-seven games of the following season, it was played twenty-seven, one twenty-six, drew one at Old Trafford, yeah, which is just so. mind-blowing. You know, I mean, that will never ever happen again. But you know, and the guy's got his invincibles. Hey, yeah, <laughs> guy's got his invincibles. I mean, it, listen, it would have been That's a, good a complete game. league Liverpool. season as well. But yeah, hey. <laughs> but but that you know, I mean, obviously that that's that's the arbitrary nature of a football season between August and May, though, isn't it? But yep. you know. <laughs> I think Arsenal drew about 10, 12 games that season. 12, yeah, yeah. 12, yeah. Still yeah. a phenomenal effort. And didn't lose I, I, was at, yeah. I was at Watford when Liverpool lost 3-0 that day and it was good because, I, you know, I think we all knew and expected we were going to win the league by that stage. But I did have my heart set on an unbeaten season because it's never been done before, apart from Arsenal and apart from Preston back in the day. But we can't have everything. Just to go back to kind of how you led into this little section though as well, in terms of his character, the man he is. You know, he is a perfect fit for Liverpool. It was said, um, some you know, before he came to Liverpool, Manchester United supposedly were interested in taking him into Old Trafford. We all know the problems they've had in terms of succession since Alex Ferguson left eight years ago. Supposedly, Klopp did speak to them. I don't know if it was a formal interview as such, but the you know the the line that came out afterwards was that basically it was like a it was like a theme park, you know, and the the, the difference between managing a a financial and kind of showbiz behemoth of a club like they are, rather than a club like Liverpool, 
very, you know, I think that that shows for a start what kind of man Klopp is. And also as well, we know because he's spoken out about it before. And even in the last week or so, when he spoke out very strongly about vaccines and how people are refusing to get vaccines, he essentially compared them to drink drivers, didn't he? But, you know, his his politics are very much in tune with a lot of people in the city and that they are left of centre. And yeah, I think that, that's an... I was going to say, I think it's easy to kind of romanticise these things with it being, oh, look how well it's gone. But I, I completely agree with you. you. You guys were taking the mick out of me there for being an Arsenal fan. There was always talk well, that potentially, was. yeah, he would potentially even succeed Arsene Wenger at Arsenal. But I don't think there's a better club in England in the Premier League that Jurgen Klopp mm. could have fitted into than Liverpool. I think wherever he would have gone, I think he would have been a success, as we said before, a genius of a manager. But I think that marriage between Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp is absolutely fantastic. And we, we've got other points we're going to need to move on to, Theo. But before we do, 2024, you alluded to at the start, is coming. That could be the end of the marriage with Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp. Yet, crucially, this summer, a number of those key players in, in building this dynasty at Liverpool that Jurgen Klopp has built from nothing have extended contracts. It's a point I've kind of tried to labour at times on, on the podcast that, to me, it seems crucial a number of those have been contracted beyond 2024. So an instance like when Sir Alex Ferguson left Manchester United and it was an ageing team that crumbled around David Moyes' tenure at that football club it doesn't happen at Liverpool with these players knowing they are signing to the project of being at Liverpool Football Club as opposed to just the manager. And it doesn't feel as though that's Klopp's way of working anyway, that he wants it to be all all about him. He wants something that he's now built to continue to to thrive, as it has done at Borussia Dortmund. Very much so. Uh, his, was, his initial contract would have run out in 2022, so none of us expect him to sign a new deal for a long time. And then the news came out of nowhere and got an extra couple of years of Klopp. Um, but he's always wanted to build the club and the team to be as good as it can, as strong as it can for his successor, so he can pass it on to whoever the next boss is. And it's one where there has been criticism of FSG that Liverpool haven't spent millions and millions on new players. They haven't even brought in plenty of new players. But then you look at the squad and it is not that bad. Like starting 11 wise, it is pretty much already there for 2024. Like you're talking about these contract extensions where you've got Alisson tied down. I think it was till 2027. So granted, he's going to be in his 30s by then, but we all know keepers get better with age. Like you look at Joan Luigi Buffon, he's still going strong in his early 40s. Granted, he's in the second division in Italy, but there's no reason why Alisson won't still be one of the best keepers in the world when that contract expires. And that's looking at what, another three years after Klopp goes. Trent's up until 2025, and I believe the only reason that'll be 2025 is because Liverpool are pretty confident that he'll be demanding and deserving of another pay rise by the time that comes around anyway. Andy Robertson, 2026. Van Dijk's tied up until, I think, a similar sort of time. That's going to be the big contract for him. That's the rest of his peak as the best defender in the world. I think well, maybe if his legs start to go a little bit and he's not someone who can play every game and be this talisman. Well, they've just signed Canate. You've got Joe Gomez. That could be a centre-back partnership for years to come. They've got those bodies there. Midfield. Oh, this season, it's just come out of nowhere. Liverpool have actually got that generation midfield there sorted for a decade. Fabinho's tied down on his new deal. I think it's another long-term one until like 2026. I'm thinking, I know you mentioned, it was one of you two mentioned, Bernardo Silva and Kevin De Bruyne and Man City midfield. Liverpool are going to have that, aren't they? Curtis Jones and Harvey Elliott, either side of Fabinho. When you know Fabinho is essentially two players in one, yeah. the same way Kante is, the same way Van Dijk is. They can just go and attack, do whatever they want in that final third. And it looks great. And you know Fabinho and Van Dijk will give you that protection. Now, Mohamed Salah, we're not going to go too much into his contract, but we know that Liverpool want to, will want to keep him. They will want to tie him down. We know it expires in two years. We know Mane and Firmino's expires in two years, but Salah is the priority there. And you think if they can keep him tied down and he goes and, and does what Ronaldo and Messi have done playing at this level until his mid-30s, that is a place for the manager. And then you've still got well, Diogo Jotters on the left wing. Kay Gordon, if he lives up to this Harvey Elliott-esque sort of potential in two, three years, we'll get him doing the steps Harvey Elliott has taken this season. That's a start in 11 there. And that is still a very strong start in 11 if you're thinking of this potential growing that can challenge for titles. I'm not saying Liverpool aren't going to sign any players in this time and this sort of team will be that 11 in 2024. You'd still expect them to add to it. They definitely still need some depth. But as a starting base for any new manager, 
that must give you a, a reason to join Liverpool. Like these players have won league titles together, won Champions Leagues together. And while they're not all going to be there in 2024, the future is as bright as it can be. And with the likes of Trent, Jones and Elliot in particular, these are players who could be at a high level, not even reach their peak for another 10 years. This could be the start of something special if they get everything else right. And that's why it's going to be a hell of a task to replace Klopp because whoever picks it up, it's a big job to follow in his footsteps, but also deliver with these players. But then maybe Klopp will fancy another couple of years. He, he did it with the last contract. He wanted to uh, yeah. he have that excitement in his team. Time to uh, see if he gets excited by seeing what Elliot Jones and Trent Alexander-Arnold can do in the years to come as well. Yeah, will be interesting indeed. Theo has actually he's just talked us right through it, but he's written a brilliant piece across on the Liverpool Echo website looking at what the eleven could look like come 2024 should Jurgen Klopp move on. So, uh, yeah, if you want to delve a bit deeper into what Theo was on about there, albeit it was pretty exhaustive, Theo, and I am giving you praise for once. Mate, <laughs> so uh, do go and check that one out. But, uh, Dan, we are two and a half years away then from 2024. and It's one of those that on podcasts and as such and I suppose the online community and social media, everyone's immediately looking for tomorrow and what is going to happen. How do you think Liverpool brace themselves for moving on past Jurgen Klopp? Is the successor even worth talking about right now? Because we know how quickly football can change. Steven Gerrard would be one name thrown out there who two seasons ago wasn't having the greatest of time. Won the league last year. He's had at times a rocky beginning to this season, albeit it looks as though it's, it's flattened out for him quite well and Rangers are going strong in Scotland, but how do you look at it yourself? Or you just live in the moment? I think so. I mean, you know, I don't think it is worth talking about a succession, but but it, 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 people will because that's the nature of the beast. That's not, and not just in the media. That's the nature of football. You know, it, it's we're all conditioned to you know to, to to look at what what's coming next. And I think sometimes you need to remind yourselves that just enjoy what you've got because as someone that's been following. Liverpool for you know th- over thirty five years, and has seen some you know relative lows compared to the absolute highs we've had in the last few years. <coughs> I'm very much of a mind that you know abs- make hay while the sun shines and relish and savour every moment of this extraordinary man who just seems who just seems like the perfect fit. You know, even when we've had dodgy r- runs of form, and, and listen, there haven't been many certainly in the last few years. But even in the you know the the, the darker moments of, of when he's been here, that knowledge. I always remember years and years ago. I only saw Kenny Dalglish play live a handful of times, really. But I always remember you know, older, gen- older folks saying, "Doesn't matter how bad the team was playing, if he was on the pitch, you always felt there was hope." And with Klopp in the dugouts, you always feel there's a bit of hope. The reality is, he will be impossible to replace, and I think it's it's pointless to even not pointless to even try, or or certainly to expect. A like for like because he is a unique character, a unique man, a unique coach, and you you know you, you cannot replicate what he's done over the last couple of years. That being said, Liverpool as a club are are run far far better now than than they were years ago, and I think if anyone can at least look to put the the right kind of structures in place, you you know I I, I would say that that you know the FSG have have as good a chance of doing it as anyone. But they're not soft. You know, they've they've been involved in sports management for a long time, obviously over the pond in America and you know and and, and now for over a decade in Liverpool. And they will be aware that you know, I mean I, I don't follow American sports at all really, but I'm sure you know, that they they we know that they have people who advise them on English football and they will be aware that they will look at what's happened at Manchester United, what's happened at Arsenal since you know, since their great managers who were there decades left. And if there are any lessons that can be learned from their experiences, then you know, then then they will try their best to do that. But I think we just have to accept that you know, we want, we want Klopp to be there till the end of time, but it ain't gonna happen. He's a human being. He's up fifty six now, is he? Give or take. I'll have a look. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do the it, Red it, Cross, it, the German. I don't think I've got to age when I write his name in pieces yet. If you news report, he would. 54. 54. Okay. Yeah. So he's still a relatively young man. However, you know, he is a very intense man. He's not, you know, we, we know that if he does something, he, he, he's all in. He gives it heart and soul. That's what he did at Mites. That's what he did at Dortmund. That's what he's done at Liverpool. You know, after nine, it would be nine years, wouldn't it, if, if he does go in 2024. 
Um, whenever that point is, we're all going to be heartbroken and a bit devastated. But as far as we know, it's not going to be happening anytime soon. So I think for now, I think it's one of them where it's kind of out of sight, out of sight, out of mind a little bit. Yeah, I'd, I'd leave it to, to, I suppose, the powers that be to be fretting and worrying about things mm. like that. And as you say, live in the moment, enjoy it. And yeah, waited long enough to be back on the perch, as it were, at the top of English football. So make sure you enjoy it whilst he's here, because Liverpool certainly won't be going anywhere from that point whilst Jurgen Klopp is at the helm. Really enjoyed this. We got through half an hour already. So we've got a few things that we do need to rattle through. So I'm going to throw two at you at once. It's the Owen Kai Gordon, you referred to him before, three days after turning 17. He's got his first professional contract at Liverpool. Big, big expectation around him. And on the transfer front as well, rumours regarding Divock Origi and Barcelona, of all clubs. What do know? <laughs> um, which one do you want me to start with, Cade or Divock? <laughs> you, you pick and choose, mate. Uh, let's go with Cade first. Um, only signed in January, didn't he, from Derby County. And the early reports from the academy were really positive. But I don't think anyone, even back then, anticipated him being in the Liverpool um, squad for pre-season quite so quickly. But he's obviously made such an impact. And there was um, quotes from, um, was it Pep Blinders, saying how he made that impact when he was with the 23s at the start of pre-season. It's like, oh, we've got another one. We've got to get him into the first team. We've got to have a look at him. We've got to have him as part of this. And you think, well, if he's a player that's causing that excitement now at such a young age, to the extent that he's had his debut in the Cup against Norwich, you're hoping that he can be another like, one like Harvey Elliott, that he can have those couple of years bedding in. Maybe he goes out on loan next year, but then he comes back when he's 18, 19, and he's fully ready to go straight into that first team and challenge for a start in place. Um, they're talking about his strengths, that what it stands out from players at that age is his positioning and the fact that he knows where the goal is, wherever he stood in the box, even if his head's down, he knows where the goal is, he knows where the posts are and he can still find his finish. And he, to have that maturity that age, like we saw it against Norwich, granted he didn't score, but he was still making challenging runs. He was testing their defence. He was unlucky not to score, to be fair. But if he's making an impact there, you just want to, without hyping him up too much, you want him to have a consistent run of games for the youth sides and to get this taste of first team football with Liverpool now, and then it's way to way up the next decision whether it is beneficial to go out on loan like Elliot did and have the season of his life at Blackburn, or if it's better to be part of the Liverpool family to learn how they play like Curtis Jones has. Both of them are in the Liverpool first team now, and you'd imagine we're going to be saying the same about Kay Gordon in two or three years' times if you can build on this early potential. And the Divock Origi one's really strange because I think it was just a report in Spain where they're they're a bit panicking about Barcelona's options because Aguero's injured and they're speculating on who could they bring in as cut price options and they suggested Origi as one. Um, there are conflicting reports about when his contract actually expires. I know Transfermarkt has it down as next summer. I think Sky said on deadline day it is next summer, but there's an option on it. But then it was a long-term deal when he signed it in 2019, so there'll be some that think he's got another two years left. Um, we have tried to get clarification for the club on that, but haven't had it confirmed either way yet. But at the moment, it, it would make sense, wouldn't it, for Divock Origi? Like, you think they've signed Martin uh, Braithwaite a couple of years ago, played for Middlesbrough in the Championship. they got Luke de Jong, who was on loan at Newcastle, didn't score in the Premier League. Divock Origi is better than both of them. He's got a better record in the top divisions than both of them. He's won more of the big prizes than both of them. He just needs a consistent run of games. And when you think how horrible it must be being at Barcelona at the moment with all that financial uncertainty, the pressure on the manager, the shadow of Lionel Messi being gone and everything. Diego Carrigui doesn't feel pressure. He can turn up knowing he's not first choice and he's barely kicked a ball all season and put two in the Barcelona net and drag his team to a Champions League final when Salah's out injured and Firmino's out injured. He could be the perfect striker for them in this situation that they're in now and that he could play anywhere along that front three. Um, Obviously, from a Liverpool point of view, we're going to push this drum, aren't we? Because it would be great to see him at Barcelona, the club that he essentially broke, because it means Liverpool would actually get a bit of money for him as well. But it would be a fitting move for him as well, because it is still a huge name. And we know all the talent he's got. He's just not been able to have those opportunities at Liverpool. But he, he deserves to play for a team where he can do it. And it's a nice stage. It's a glamorous stage going to Barcelona rather than ending up at, I don't know, like looking at the Premier League table, say a Crystal Palace, something like that. 
I, I had to be kind there. <laughs> yeah, what did you I think it was going I, for? I thought, I, thought, I thought you were going to go in with a low blow then, mate. I thought... <laughs> well, you've still got Aubameyang, Aubameyang and Lacazette. If you're asking me this question in six months, who knows? <laughs> but yeah, it's, it would make sense for them. And Barcelona, if it's like they can't really afford much, it could make sense for them as well. But you'd still think it seems a bit far-fetched. Like we know Jurgen Klopp was surprised that no one came in for him in the summer. He said that, I think, after the AC Milan game. Um, Origi's got a bit more fire in the belly. This Liverpool story's not done just yet. But go on, Barcelona. Make that story come true. Give him that dream. Let him have a star stage at one of Europe's big clubs. And then you can win the Europa Conference League with him in something like next season. That's what we want to see, isn't it? And give Michael Edwards a chance to maybe stitch them up once more before yeah, he goes. Yeah, exactly. So that, that wouldn't be a bad <laughs> way, would it? Divock Origi, I'd say I'm, I'm maybe one of one of few, but big fan of Divock Origi. I think he, he does offer something, albeit maybe not as consistently as some would like, but doesn't always get a consistent run. But anyway, we'll move on from him. You did mention Newcastle United very tentatively there, Theo, with Luke de Jong. So I'm going to pick up on that <laughs> as my segue. Dan, let's talk about the Saudi takeover at Newcastle United. Amanda Staveley fronting it up for them. Are we scared? Is there any fear to be had regarding Newcastle United? Is this Man City Mark II equally? How are they going to be able to do it with FFP? And how long is it going to be until they are realistic challengers to Liverpool? I'm not scared or frightened for Liverpool as such. I I am scared and frightened for the game of football. You know, I, 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 I do think it sets a very dangerous, damaging precedent that all these concerns that have been raised by the likes of Amnesty International and various other bodies, including the British government, who, who not too long ago were you know, refusing to sell them arms, but they're quite fine to sell them a football club. You know, our, our colleague Sean Bradbury wrote an excellent piece last night, basically saying this is the ugly, the ugly truth at the heart of English football now. Um, you, you know, I know our, our, our esteemed friend Theo is writing a piece for the morning basically looking at it from, from, from a Liverpool perspective, you know, from, from, from a moral perspective, um, 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 and, what it kind of mean, uh, and what it kind of means for Liverpool. In, in, in the short term, I mean, I don't know all the ins and outs of FFP, but my, it will take a long time for Newcastle to generate the kind of revenue that they can spend enough money on the top players to really threaten. They're obviously going to be better than they were. I mean, Last 10, 15 years, they've been, they've been a year. How many times have they been relegated? The last 10, 15 years, must be at least three times, I think. Twice. Yeah. Twice. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, that, 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 that ain't going to be happening anytime soon. But it, you know, it's a salutary warning, isn't it? Because even in this era of glory that we've lived through, which a lot of the, a lot of the cry asses on social media wouldn't be, you know, who didn't have to watch the likes of Torben Picnic and Sean Dundee and various others playing for Liverpool in the 90s when. You know, we were pretty hopeless. Even in recent years when, you know, the Liverpool owners had the nerve not to buy a gazillion pounds worth of footballers during the pandemic. Get them out. We name new owners. It's the only way we compete. The, rea- the only way we can compete. The reality is the only way Liverpool can now operate on the same financial stratosphere as Manchester City, Chelsea and Paris and now Newcastle is to have an oligarch, a state owner. Is that a price worth paying if it means you if, if it means you lose your soul, you sell your soul? Not to me. There would be some people who would argue that Liverpool already have already sold their soul by selling out to Americans. And you know, some of the things that have gone on the last few years with FSG, we know they they've blotted their copybook with, with various issues, seventy seven pound tickets, the Super League, obviously, um, furloughing staff and this, that and the other. However, there's always been a you know, they've they've made mistakes, bad mistakes. But at least they've been prepared to hold their hands up, and ultimately, they've delivered the league title that we, that me personally, I, th- I never thought I'd see Liverpool win again. They brought, they they got Jurgen Klopp in. They're not perfect owners, but the reality is there are no perfect owners. I would much rather have what we've got now than being in a situation where you're actually having to kind of say, is this um, it, it, morally, am I am I comfortable with with the people who are owning my club? These, I'm sure these are questions that new, some Newcastle supporters will be will be asking themselves. Some won't be. I, I, saw, I saw a tweet yesterday. One young lad, apparently, who's obviously had to live through some pretty grim, grim times, said it was the greatest day of his life seeing them taken over. And I can understand to, up to a point where they're coming from because it's easy for us as Liverpool supporters who fed off the top table most of our lives to kind of 
be rather dismissive of these kind of things. But when you've had little taste of success, very, very small taste of success, that none, none of which have led to 1969 UEFA Cup, I think is the last time they won a trophy yeah. in Newcastle. You know, it's a, it, 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 that's even before my lifetime, so that is a long time ago. Whoa! So, so I do yeah. get, <laughs> I do get where they're coming from to to a certain extent, but it's uh, unfortunately it's a damning indictment of the fact that this takeover has been allowed to go ahead. Is a damning indictment of football and society as it is now. It definitely is, but I suppose it's how far you track it back as well, Theo. I've seen an interview with, with Rick Parry today, who's now obviously chairman at the EFL, used to be chief chief executive at Liverpool, used to be chief executive of the Premier League when that launched. I've seen a lot of people commenting on this, saying well, it's no better than the European Super League in terms of the amount of money that's just going to flush into Newcastle United overnight. But it's modern football and it's, it's where we're at. Dan mentioning their FSG and the American ownership. Well, really, it's the name Liverpool and where the stadium is located. But other than that, the Premier League is a global league. It's not really the English game anyway anymore, is it? No, it's one where it could have happened to Liverpool before. I remember, uh, was it DIC trying to buy the club before Hicks and Gillette? And that was... Taxi Sinoatra as well. Sinoatra as well. There was the promise of all these millions. Um, Sinatra did go to City and he did sign a load of players, but it wasn't quite the level of they've had now under uh, Sheikh Mansour. And it's one where clubs have been able to build like that before FFP. So that's how come Chelsea and City were able to just buy their way to the top overnight. And it's not really how you can do it now because of FFP. But it's just who is the perfect owner? Like you think if you're a Liverpool fan, you'd say it's someone, a cop season ticket holder who wins the Euro millions and then wants to put all that money into the club, but has enough to keep it going for 10, 20 years. Yeah, signing them back play every summer. The Euro millions, they'd have to nip to the casino, put it all on red and it come in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you need, need to multiply that, that income, wouldn't they? You need someone who's got the money to sign an Mbappe but not got enough, um, not got as much as Sheikh Mansur and Abramovich. So you can still um, scoff at them going, oh, they're buying the league because Liverpool aren't because we're not as rich as them. It just There is a very th- thin line between it and it, it doesn't work. There isn't a perfect owner. It's just the way that FSG do things. I think there's a certain pride in it. The fact that they'll go and sign a Mohamed mm-hmm. Salah or a Sadio Mane. Granted, 35 million was a lot of money at the time, but it wasn't going and spending 100 million on Lukaku. It was still growing with them, taking the, to this elite level. And then now it's signing a Harvey Elliott for four or five million and seeing him grow. Yeah, it's not as exciting as being able to spend big money on these big signings. I'm sure there are Liverpool fans that would love to see him and Mbapp- sign Mbappe or Haaland and have that guaranteed success every year. But it, it is more enjoyable when it's a fight, when it's a struggle. That's what made the Premier League win so enjoyable because there had been 30 years of struggle because it was so tough to see, oh, they've finally done it. It's what made Istanbul so great because they were 3-0 down. They've had to come back. And even then, these are still not big things to overcome to the extent of some of the lesser clubs. Like Liverpool have been at the top table for the majority of the past 60 years we're talking about here. But then... FSG, they'll get stick. When the Newcastle takeover was confirmed, FSG out was trending on Twitter. But I've just got to feel it's better the devil you know. They they are better mm. than Hicks and Gillette. They have done a lot more for the club and taken them to a level that David Moores could only dream of. What they've done is they've given Liverpool a fighting chance. And it's not perfect. It's not going to mean they can win the Premier League this year, next year, year after year after year after, which City would idealistically be aiming for. But they've got Jurgen Klopp and they've got a fighting chance. And that's all Jurgen Klopp needs to deliver success. Um, Yes, it is going to get tougher because Premier League is this global division. It is the biggest league in the world. It's the most viewed league in the world. And when you've got players like Cristiano Ronaldo, Mohamed Salah, it is just going to get more and more. There are going to be owners wanting to buy in. You'll know yourself how much this rumoured Arsenal would be Spotify takeover, what that could do to your club, and that could change Arsenal completely. That could bring them very much back to the very top table, being one of the richest. And there are other clubs in the mix there. Like We're seeing it down in the conference with Wrexham, and they've got Hollywood owners throwing money at it to try and buy their way up the Football League. Salford have technically done the same with the class of 92 It's not every club. It's not the same millions at hand as a City or a Chelsea. 
but this is the way it's going. And sometimes you've just got to, I suppose, be grateful for the hand that you have got if you've got this standpoint against others. I much rather have Liverpool doing it the way they are doing it. It's not perfect. There are going to be complaints and that isn't going to change. But at least there's a bit of pride in still doing it with that little bit of a struggle than Newcastle rocking up and being able to do it overnight, which they won't be able to do because of FFP. But the way Chelsea and City have done it in the years before, um, it's competition. It makes it tougher, but that's what makes the successes and the triumphs more enjoyable. Yeah, I suppose professional football ever since you could date back to the game going professional. It's all been about who's had the most money for players to go wherever they have ended up going. But anyway, we'll have to wait and see what the impact on Liverpool is. Today's episode, though, was all about King Klopp, who in six years has taken the cop back to the top. From myself, Guy Clark, Theo Squires and Dan Kay, thanks for joining us. It's bye for now.